and gentlemen, I want to thank President Leo Spinelli, who succeeded me as president of the Historical Society, for putting together today's program. I want to thank the, thank the executive board of the Historical Society for doing an annual program such as this. And I want to thank the commemorative community for its interest in the 1816 schoolhouse, which we've carefully and diligently restored to its present site and is a valuable and important resource for the community. Ron and Glenn, who are behind me, are what they call signs of rain. Well, the clouds opened up yesterday, but today it's beautiful, bright sunshine, and this is the first time ever that music has been played at the 1816 schoolhouse. When I envisioned this building, I envisioned it not only as an opportunity for it to be a chance for people to learn what education was like at a one-room schoolhouse, but also for it to be a place where perhaps small recitals could be held, perhaps people could come and enjoy and share some culture. Mamaroneck is probably one of the most diversified cultural communities that I know, and I'm proud to be one of its citizens, as I'm sure you two are, all are as well, and a special welcome to my fellow historian and brethren of the Bill of Rights, Goldie Solomon, out of Port Chester. I also want to thank Judge for coming and a few of the other dignitaries. Let me tell you how this got started. It was a, it's a, it's a funny thing. When you fall into the ebbs and the valleys of history, you never know where it's going to take you. I discovered a little hint of, uh, of interest when a cannonball was uncovered on Fenimore Road, way up on top of this hill behind me. I was wondering about that cannonball because 229 years ago, yesterday, the Battle of Heathcote Hill, or skirmish of Heathcote Hill, was held on that, on that site. And I was wondering if it was from that engagement. My inquiry told me it belonged someplace else in history. Let me share that with you. Westchester in the War of 1812. A nation denied the conception of the past will become a ship denied its rudder. Disabled in dealing with its present or planning adequately for its future, a society would come to question its values as well as its very resolve. This day the spotlight we flash into the darkness of the past illuminates one of the nine major conflicts this nation has fought since its inception. Although largely forgotten, the legacy of the War of 1812 has left some footprints here in Westchester County. Unquestionably, the largest footprint was left by Daniel D. Tompkins. Not a household name. Not one that you would ordinarily remember. He was a Scarsdale native, and the governor of the state of New York from 1807 to 1817. By virtue of his office, Tompkins was both the general of the state militia and the commander of the state's navy. At this period of history, the defense of the nation depended primarily on military organizations of the states, all of which were under the command of the respective governors over which the federal government could exercise no direct control unless a state's militia was sworn into federal service. You got that? The federal government could not interfere with the militia of a state unless it was sworn to federal service. But Daniel Thompson was a very important man at the time. As early as April 1812, in anticipation of an offing war, President Madison asked the states to supply 100,000 militia for state service. Of this number, New York would supply 13,500 men. The existing militia in Westchester was the 15th Brigade. Its commanders, its commanders were first General Thomas Carpenter, followed by General Pierre Van Cortland. 
War was indeed declared against Great Britain on June the 18th, 1812. The news reached New York City on the morning of the 20th. It's just so happened that at this time, the most effective part of the entire United States Navy was right in New York Harbor. The President, the Essex, the Hornet, the United States, and the Congress, the Argus, all lay at anchor in our New York Harbor and were immediately put out to sea to be safe on June the 21st, as soon as the war was declared. Their mission was to disrupt any British blockade before it even got started. New York had left for its defenses only 34 gunboats, of which 20 were in the commission and the balance under repair at the Brooklyn Navy Yard. In other words, there are only 20 gunboats for the entire defense of New York State. The British did indeed blockade New York's lower harbor, but had no attempt at blockading Long Island Sound, which we know is, stands right behind us. That meant that there was absolutely no difficulty in getting to and from New York City via the Long Island Sound. By April 1813, things began to change. The British sealed off the eastern entrance to the Sound. By June of 1813, the British blockading squadron was visibly present in Long Island Sound daily. Its flagship was the Romilius. Other British ships were the Orpheus, the Valiant, the Acosta, heading Al Atlanta. Sir Thomas Masterman, hardy of the Battle of Trafigula, Trafigula fame, was in command of the flotilla. In September 1813, the flotilla's presence was felt in our waters. On September the 8th, the sun rose with the British at anchor off of Rye Neck. The British came ashore in Mamaroneck and they stole 60 to 80 heads of sheep. Thereafter, an American sloop was chased into Mamaroneck's harbor, right here, escaping with a cannonball piercing its mast. That's the very same cannonball that we uncovered on Fenimore Road. Later that afternoon, the British anchored off of New Rochelle. Pandemonium gripped the city. A latter-day Paul Revere rode through the town proclaiming the British were invading. The British were invading through Davenport's neck and were intent on plundering and burning the Rochelle to the ground. The local militia stood ready through the night, but no invasion by the British ever came. On September the 9th, a flotilla of 25 gunboats approached from the south under under captain lewis by 9 a.m the gunboats were stretched across the entire length of long island sound from huckleberry island to sands point each carried a crew of 36 sailors and one 20 pound gun or howitzer each boat measured 45 feet in length and were no match for a british frigate which was the largest fighting ship afloat in the world at the time. At three masts, at three masts and carrying 44 guns, any sloop and a sloop having um, one mast and carrying between 18 and 33 guns, the Americans stood absolutely no chance to the superior British fleet. After an exchange of between 30 and 40 salvos, the Americans retreated to Hempstead Harbor to flank the British. Instead, the British, blocked, the British broke off the engagement and were left in control of Long Island Sound. The detachment of militia that watched this naval engagement from the shore in Davenport's Neck withdrew from the field on September the 13th. Likewise, the militia posted in Mamaroneck also withdrew on the same day. History would later record that all payment for their services were later refused by the federal government. Sounds like another unfunded government mandate. But who
who were the militia? Who defended our shores between September the 8th and September the 13th, 1813? Let's see if we can put some names and identification of who these men were. Captain William O'Dell and his Greenberg Company of Militia was stationed right here in Mamarinet. Captain Benjamin Fowler and his Westchester Company were also stationed right here in our Mamarinet. Captain John B. Gillespie and his company from West Farms were likewise dispatched here to Mamarinet. Captain Lawrence Davenport and Lieutenant Elijah Horton defended their hometown of New Rochelle. Captain Bishop and his Eastchester Company were also defending New Rochelle. Let's turn the calendar now to 1814. The news of the British capturing and burning Washington, D.C. reached the area on August the 26th. The next day, Governor Tompkins, the man I referred to in the beginning of this speech, ordered the immediate consolation of the militias of Rockland, Westchester, Kings County, Queens County, Richmond County, Nassau County, and Suffolk County, with their combined headquarters to be made in Brooklyn Heights. He was pending and planning for what he seemed would be an obvious invasion of New York City. No invasion ever came. However, the British, British fleet did reappear in Long Island Sound on October the 1st. Captain Lewis was again dispatched with 19 gunboats this time and two bomb catchers, but never was able to get a shot off at the enemy. On November the 17th, 1814, the British were again seen as far north as the Narrows and the Hell's Gate, but did not go beyond that point. Word had reached the British of the intent invention of something that was created by Robert Fulton. It was called Robert Fulton's Torpedo. And the British Navy rarely stood still at anchor or allowed itself vulnerable by traveling through the narrow passage. They feared something that was a brand new invention. Thereafter, peace came on Christmas Eve, 1814. At the time, the news traveled slowly it did not arrive here in time to prevent the Battle of New Orleans on January the 8th, 1815. Victory there propelled General Andrew Jackson to the White House in the election of 1828. But one of our own native Westchester Governor Daniel Tompkins, the man I mentioned to you at the beginning and the middle of this addressed to you on the War of 1812. He dispersed more than $3 million for New York and the United States in less than 40 days. He mustered into the field 50,000 men at various, various points of grave danger. He equipped the army and every last man with the things that they needed to do their job. In less than 60 days, when the credit of the national government was gone, he raised $1 million for the public service, for the public service, and unwisely made himself personally liable for the entire amount. His patriotism and devotion to duty were his very undoing. Due to his lack of business training, his personal habits, and failure to keep a proper set of receipts, he was charged by his political enemies as a defaulter, a villain, a swindler, a patriotic. Eventually, his private property was sold by the sheriff he was imprisoned for debt, and his wife was carried out of their home on her sickbed and laid in the street by the sheriff, penniless and now homeless. Although he was honored to be 
elected James Monroe's vice president of the United States in 1816, a position which he held through 1825, neither the state of New York or the federal government ever, ever reimbursed him for his losses or apologized to him for his disgrace. Although only a heartbeat from the presidency, Daniel Thompson died in 1825, still bankrupt, very embittered. Today, with the unveiling of our recollections of the War of 1812 for a new generation to ponder, we salute Vice President Tompkins and the 2,260 individuals who gave their lives for a tattered flag that came to be known as the Star Spangled Banner. Through their sacrifices, they helped forge a nation. May they no longer be forgotten, and may God bless all of you and the United States of America. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, this took quite a while to research. I'm glad I could share this with you. And I want you to know that that Star Spangled Banner is the same one that flies above this 1816 schoolhouse. It was of the same time period, 15 stars, 15 stripes, a beautiful sight no matter where you see it from. Mamaroneck has a rich and vital history to even the War of 1812. And I hope you'll join me in asking the politicians in the community to erect a New York State historical marker to the memory of what happened here in the War of 1812. Thank you very much. God bless you all. Does anybody want to ask any questions? Well, I, I, believe, in I believe in keeping it going. I believe that we have to be united. United we stand, divided we fall. It's very important to keep history alive, pass on to the younger generations who are the future leaders of the community and the country, our history, so they don't make the same mistakes. And you can see it now in government. They don't know our history. They are making the same mistakes. So, as I said, united we stand, divided we fall. And that's it. Thank you, Bill. As I said, Goldie and I were historians together, and uh, we've, uh, we've had a long history of almost 25 years together. Hi, Steve. John, what's become of the Cannonball? Yeah. Cannonball found itself into the history research room. Now, this is uh, not common knowledge, uh, but I'll make it uh, brief and to the point. There was no security system at the library. History research room was broken into twice. It disappeared. Uh, now the library has a security system. You know the way it is. Usually after somebody gets hurt at an intersection, then they remember to put the traffic light on. Exactly. Exactly. I think we have to have a memorial out here for the 1812. Absolutely. But as I said, if we don't unite, nothing is going to happen. United we stand and divided we do fall. Yes, Bill. Uh, John, uh, did you uh, have the name of that ship that was chasing to the harbor, the American ship? No. It was just an American one-masted schooner. That's the, okay. it was, and the cannonball, the, the writings that I've read on it, the cannonball from the British frigate actually pierced the uh, mast and kept on going. It actually broke the mast. Yeah. Perfect shot. <laughs> Perfect shot. Uh, quick question. Were the... Uh, Fort Schuyler and Fort Ton a reaction? I know they weren't there in 1812, but were they a reaction to this British fleet being in the Sound? The British fleet in Long Island Sound put chills up and down the spine of every every one of these communities. Because all they had to do was go ashore, pillage and burn and do anything. The, the increased fortification definitely came as a result as as a result of that. Because we we were burned twice. We were not supposed to be engaged in that second war with the British, but it happened. 
And here we here we find ourselves with you know with our pants down. So that's why you had those forts for Clinton and things like that. Uh, you know, were reinforced, and the armaments went up. Now, of course, everything is being shut down and closed. So I guess we don't anticipate any uh, uh, sneak attacks. I think there was a big problem in this whole area. We were not Dutch. We were loyalists to the King of England. And the King of England had his ships out here in the harbor, in the sound, uh, in Portchester along the Byron River. We had these saw pits who were there to uh, repair the King's Navy, which was out here in the sound. The King owned the forests and the, and the pine trees. We couldn't own those, okay? So we basically were loyalists until we began to turn from loyalism to patriotism. It took quite a while. We were a fledgling really nation at the time. We really were. We really didn't didn't have a lot of resources. We, we depended on the states for just about everything. The federal government was as as uh, as weak as any any other time in history. And uh, without the states, we we wouldn't exist as a country. Had we lost the War of 1812, might have been a different story entirely. But when you go, when you leave today, stop and pay homage to the uh, marker that's on Fenimore in Portland for the uh, uh, skirmish battle of Heathcote Hill uh, 229 years ago yesterday. It's, uh, it's, uh, it's the first state historical marker that was ever placed in this community. And uh, it was my pleasure to, uh, to be, have, have that put here so many years ago. There are two others in the community, but I think uh, the War of 1812 is deserving of one as well. Not many towns can say they were invaded by the British. We can actually lay claim to that. Remember, the British never came ashore in North Shell where they were expecting them, but they did come here. Well, I believe Michelle them about fighting to December 15th. Do you think they can help us? Come on up, go. Well, I thought you would do it. Okay. I'm sorry to tell you about one of the major things that I'm fighting for other than the United States Cadet Nurse Corps bid for veteran status, is December 15th is the most important day in every United States citizen's history. Government didn't know about December 15th. Lawyers did not know about December 15th. College students at SUNY Purchase, um, um, SUNY Purchase Westchester Community or Manhattanville didn't even know about December 15th. And December 15th was, wasn't even taught in the high schools. December 15th, our 50 stars and the American flag stands for the people of the 50 United States, not government which comes and goes. But December 15th, 1791, our Bill of Rights was added to the United States Constitution, gave us freedom of religion, freedom of speech, freedom of the press, the right of redress. Come on, you got some problem? Come to your legislators and redress, okay? Tell them what the problem is. No search and seizure. 13th and 16th gave people of color some rights. The 19th Amendment, ladies, finally gave me and my sex, you and me, the right to vote. I didn't give you all the rights, but there are plenty of rights, the people's rights, that have to be protected from government, which doesn't know doesn't know our rights and doesn't care and keeps and keeps uh, violating our rights. We have to get to our federal legislators and we have to say we want a high holy holiday honoring December 15th, the people's rights in the 50 United States. If we don't unite and do that and get ourselves, it's not on most American calendars, but it is on some military calendars because they are the freedom fighters that put their lives on the line for us 24 hours a day to keep freedom alive in this country. But we have to help. And what better way than to get to these legislators who only care about their pay, their benefits, and their retirement, which they control. We have nothing to say about that. So please, they're already violating our Bill of Rights, but we need your help. Get to your federal legislators and tell them, we want December 15th a holiday honoring the people, the citizens of the United States. I just want to give you a hist historical segue into, into Goldie's uh, uh, reference to the 19th Amendment. That's the that's the time in, in 1920 when women first got the right to vote. 
in the 1920 election, Woodrow, uh, Woodrow Wilson was not the candidate. Harding was the candidate. And Warren G. Harding was the product of, the, of, a, of, a, of a broken convention with uh, cigar-filled rooms. Warren G. Harding was probably uh, the most, uh, how would I put this uh, in a delicate way for you? Uh, he was a ladies' man. He had many girlfriends in many communities in many ports. His wife knew about it as well, but for some reason the women loved him anyway and voted for him overwhelmingly in the 1920 election. And as far as the Bill of Rights go, there are two that are closest to my heart. The First Amendment, freedom of speech, and the right to privacy. Those are my two favorites. Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen. I'll turn you back to Leo Spinelli and enjoy the sounds of rain before it comes back. I see Mr. Larimer just came in. Mr. Larimer, would you like to say a few words? Uh -huh. I think uh, okay. it's nice to be here. Uh, our, next our next program is next week, and it's the seventh day at the church, which is located next to the Legion Hall. It's next Sunday at 4 o'clock. <coughs> I'll be having refreshments. Also, we have this poster on the side here. That's the, uh, a poster of the 99 students that uh, passed away in, in the world that went to the Manic School System. There'll be posters all over the, the community about it. So keep in touch and find out what it's all about. So the program is open and we'll have a little refreshment.